Hello everyone and welcome back to our series of bite-sized employment law videos. I'm here again with my colleague Sara Ibrahim. Hi Sara. Hi Emily. And this time we are not discussing a pandemic related issue but we're taking a deep dive into the issue of worker status and the recent judgment of the Supreme Court in the Uber case. So this hotly anticipated judgment was handed down a few weeks ago, almost five years after the case was first heard in the tribunal. And the Supreme Court upheld the first instance decision that the Uber drivers were workers within the extended Lim B definition under the Employment Rights Act, the National Minimum Wage Act and the Working Time Regulations. So Sara, in brief summary, what is the significance of this landmark decision? Well, Emily, Lord Leggett provided some very interesting clarification as to how the court should approach the question of whether an individual is a worker for the purposes of those acts, and therefore whether they qualify for the various rights and entitlements. So we're thinking about things such as holiday pay, sick pay and national minimum wage. These are available to workers but not to independent contractors. Now, this decision has been heralded as a sea change within the field of platform-based working arrangements and the gig economy in particular, but it also has wider reaching ramifications in UK employment law more generally. And it's going to shape how tribunals and courts are going to be determining employment status in any type of setting. Yeah, so Sarah, before we take a deep dive into the judgment, um, I thought it'd be useful to set out the basics in terms of worker status um, to begin with um, and the law as it existed pre-Uber. So the term worker is defined in the ERA and in other pieces of, of employment legislation as an individual who has entered into or works under A, a contract of employment. So Lim A is very clear. It essentially means that all employees are workers or B, any contract, whether express or implied, and whether oral or in writing, whereby the individual undertakes to do or perform personally any work or services for another party to the contract, whose status is not, by virtue of the contract, that of a client or customer of any profession or business undertaking carried on by the individual. So it's the Lim B part that has been the subject of extensive scrutiny by the tribunals and courts. And um, Sarah, did you want to say a few words on, on the Lim B definition before we go into Uber? Yes, Emily, it's been well established for some time now that the key elements required to satisfy this definition of a Lim B worker are, firstly, there must be a contract between the worker and the putative employer. That contract must require personal service. That means the contract must be for the worker to personally carry out the work in return for remuneration. As you've alluded to, the other party to the contract must not be the customer or client of any business undertaking or profession carried on by the individual. And there has been much debate over whether there needs to be a mutuality of obligation between the parties. Now that means there's an obligation on one party to provide work and the other party to carry that work out. And that is a mandatory requirement for employee status. Now there isn't enough time to cover this in detail today, but suffice to say, for the present purposes, mutuality of obligation is relevant to worker status, but is less stringent in relation to workers than employees. Yeah, and, um, and just a, a last point on, um, on worker status. Um, there's a whole host of relevant factors for determining whether an individual is carrying on a business and whether the other party is a customer of that business. And so examples of these factors include the degree of control exercised by the employer, the exclusivity of the arrangement, whether the individual is actively marketing their services to the world in general, the method of payment, who supplies any equipment that's used, and the level of risk assumed by the individual. And so those are just some of the factors, but there are uh, many more. Um, so Sarah, looking at the Uber judgment then, um, what essentially um, was Uber's case 
well, Emily, we don't have time to go into the, the ins and outs of Uber's case, but in short, their principal argument was founded on the contractual documentation. So the agreement was actually between the drivers and Uber BV. So that's the Dutch parent company, which essentially said that Uber was just a platform that the drivers who they referred to as customers could use to connect with the passengers. So the bookings were actually managed by Uber London, but they argued that there was no written contract between them and the drivers for the provision of driving services. Yeah, and so <clears throat> we now know that the Supreme Court roundly rejected that argument. So Lord Leggett delivered one particular phrase that really sums up the tenor of the whole judgment. And that is the primary question was one of statutory interpretation, not contractual interpretation. So in other words, the Supreme Court made clear that whilst the written contract is of course relevant, it is not the be all and end all of the analysis in defining the relationship. And it's much more important to look at the relationship in practice. So Sarah, what did the Supreme Court say about statutory interpretation in this context? Well, Emily, this is such a key point. So the Supreme Court endorsed a purposive approach. That is the approaching the issue of worker status by first and foremost, considering the purpose of the relevant employment legislation. So not the contracts, the legislation. And the purpose is to give protection to vulnerable individuals who have little or no say over their pay and working conditions because they are, and this is to quote, in a subordinate and dependent position Position in relation to a person or organisation which exercises control over their work, and that's paragraph 71 to 76 of the judgment. So in applying this test to the Uber drivers, the Supreme Court found the drivers were in a position of subordination and dependence. There were five key factors relied on. I'll just summarise them very briefly. So firstly, Uber dictates how much drivers are paid. Secondly, the contractual terms imposed on the drivers, well, the drivers had no real right to amend them. Thirdly, Uber controls drivers' choices about whether to accept or decline a passenger. So for example, they don't know the destination of the passenger until the journey is accepted. Fourthly, Uber had a significant amount of control over how the driver delivers their services. Uh, for example, the route that drivers are supposed to follow. And finally, Uber restricts communications between drivers and passengers, and Uber handles all complaints and any further interactions. Yeah. So kind of taking all those factors together, um, the Supreme Court found that the relationship is very tightly controlled and defined by Uber, despite the fact that the workers have autonomy um, in that they're free to, to determine when and where they work. So to sum all of that up very briefly, that the key takeaways from the judgment in terms of the test for worker status are um, firstly, all the circumstances of the relationship will be taken into account, so not just the written terms. Secondly, the key question is whether the individual is in a position of dependency and subordination. Mm. And thirdly, whilst the test for worker status still involves the weighing up of a number of factors, that the type of factors that, that I mentioned earlier, it is now clear that a high degree of control will militate strongly in favour of the individual being considered a worker. So we do have more clarity, um, but it's safe to say that there is not total clarity and there's still fairly um, uh, murky areas surrounding the question of worker status. Um, and I thought it would just be useful to finish on, um, on the fact that back in 2017, um, the Taylor Review recommended that the government should actually set out a detailed test for employment and worker status in legislation in order to eradicate any uncertainty. Um, the government consulted on that proposal in, in 2018, and um, that they're yet to publish any legislation of that nature. It's safe to say that there's no sign of this coming anytime soon. And um, so for the time being, we are left with the guidance provided in, in the case law. Um, so I think that that wraps up our, um, our video and um, thank you very much for watching um, and um, feel free to get in touch with any questions.